next presenter is Catherine Nash. Um, she's going to be talking about a case study of um, early lagoon, lagoon closure. Well, good morning. And um, yeah, it's always fun to talk about poop. So. This is a, I will say the time frame on this project is, let's say, a little over five and a half years from the time we started to the time we got vegetation on the site. So it was a long process. I wouldn't expect that it would take that long again, but there were, we had some little things. Looking here, how many lagoons do y'all see? One? Well, there's three. And this was a catch and egg operation with six houses, and the lagoon size was unknown. There was 11 to 12 acre feet of storage, which is Basically, you know, everyone goes to Friday night football games for high school or, you know, the size of a football field, 11, 10 to 11 feet deep in sludge. The operation began in around 78, and the operators chose to shut down the facility in May of 2006. Now going back to this, does this look like a dry facility? This, the operator claimed that this was dry. What they'd done is they had quit pumping into the lagoons, and they were supposedly bringing in trucks every couple of weeks to pump out of the pits at the end of the bars. And it was basically watering, but it was running into little mini lagoons and then into this. So, uh, this was a demonstration project trying to figure out cost for this type of project. Um, there was some concerns about impaired watershed, which ironically the information that Kevin showed earlier in this watershed the, from avian sources was very, very teeny tiny as far as the poultry industry, which is very heavy in this area. And then, um, so also proper closure to mitigate water quality impacts. Okay, so now here we can kind of see the three lagoons, you've got the big one that was built for the original four houses. They came back in in the early 80s, added another two added here. At one point, the water came up from the creek and started to flow into the lagoons, not the other way around. So they built a berm and dug out here to kind of create another little mini lagoon. And for surveying the existing site, we tried numerous methods, but we finally went to using um, a total station, a GPS station, marking the top, shutting the range pole down into the, through the crust down 10, 11 feet deep, pulling it out, figuring out the level, writing it down, logging it in, and then putting an Excel sheet to generate uh, points. We did soil sampling to determine the in situ materials below the lagoon trying to look for leakage and where we thought it might, um, if it had been leaking over the years, where that plume might have gone so that we knew if we just cleaned up and removed the sludge, did we get everything or were we going to have had some other issues. And construction specifications, develop <coughs> site specific, and that was a massive intact task of compiling all of our national construction specifications marking out stuff that didn't belong. Um, developed a draft, a draft closure plan, which requires approval from TCEQ in our case, which is our environmental EPA for Texas. Um, construction plans, contract, and construction at the cover site, and then the final checkout of the practice. And this site. The lagoons are actually constructed at the very top of the hill. From an engineering design standpoint, it was so there was absolutely no outside runoff going into it. They used the material from the lagoons to construct the pads. It sloped the pads back into the lagoon, so it eliminated outside runoff. Uh, we had, had an excellent field engineer technician that worked with us on this project, and he managed to find the original contractor that built the facility in the 70s. Of course, the guys like I built, you know, 200 lagoons or more over the course of the years, and I have no idea. Um, we were able to confirm that there were the two lagoons. No plans were available, and found out when the water was hooked up for the site. So this is us going down and sampling about 14, 15 feet below ground level to look at the soils and pulled samples and had those analyzed. And 
we ran across some gray green soils and we started to have a heart attack, but fortunately there was no septic cones with it, so we're, and it was consistent with the soils in that area. And we tried to use the sledge judge. Have any of y'all know what a sledge judge is? Well, this one we shoved in the ground and nothing came, nothing went into the sledge judge. Um, we tried pacing across the lagoon and, and sticking poles in and trying to keep our bearings, and that didn't work very well. So we ended up with the survey, the survey grade GPS unit. Um, we did some aerial photo reconnaissance to figure out where we needed to go with this site. This site is in a less than 1% slope area. So depending on which way you looked, it depended on which way it looked like the water might run from the site. So, uh, that power lines, the site was surveyed, I think, three times before we finally got the power lines on the survey. And during construction, they actually, even with power lines marked and the little markers on the ground, they still managed to get the power line. Um, we collected about 2,000 data points for CAD. We used Eagle Point initially, and then the time we transitioned to Civil 3D. So the first prior project was done in one software package, the second was in another. And we modeled the existing pond with sludge, the bottom of the pond, the wastewater level in the pond, the proposed final grade, and also your existing concrete slabs to try to make your volumes in those determinations. And we had numerous meetings with our environmental commission, and then uh, the final closure plan. We, the construction specifications, if you're interested in need to do one of these. You might want to turn it And these are located, there's a draft set that are on the LPES website from my previous presentation. I did a webinar about two years ago on this project, and it's got all of the details on this. Plan, the specifications, a set of drawings for construction or deconstruction in this case. And we tried to go through a turnkey process where we would just hire one firm to come in and do everything. And folks started at 1.8 million and went up to closer to over 3 million. We had less than 200000 in our budget. <laughs> so, back to ground zero, which is part of the reason that this project took so long was going through that, as well as the landowner in the process of terror. He, would, he tore down the barns himself, and he had an accident and passed away during the project as well. So. Um, Finally, we, we split it into phases where we were just removing and stockpiling the sludge on site to let it dry in the rows. And $3.25 per cubic yard of sludge removed, that's about the same cost as what it is to build a new of it. So that's just to move it and stockpile it on site. That doesn't do anything like else. And we also, as soon as we went to the contract, we got five to six inches of rain on the site. And the contractor was responsible for removing this water because of where it happened in the contracting phase. But we agreed that if we got more rain, we would pay him for that. And um, removal was around the we put 18,500, it's probably closer to 20,000 cubic yards of sludge that was removed. Total cost of that was around 60,000. And the company that did this also did railroad cleanup, so this part of the process probably took about two and a half months. But they would stop work and go clean up a spill where a train had spilled and then come back to work. So it wasn't really a true two and a half months of working every day, 40 hours. Weeks. Um, pictures of just the pumps, the irrigation, the excavator to get to the pumps. 
the water level differed, varied from one side of the pond to another side. I mean, you could go here, and the water would be at the surface, and you could go here, or no, go here, and where you go down, and the water was down about, you know, two feet from the bottom, and over here, the water is sitting at a couple inches below the surface. So that was kind of an interesting observation. Um, they used what you typically see a rock crushing plant for the conveyors to move it. They started with this vibratory hopper, I mean, a stationary hopper. They would have this little guy, they'd stop, and they'd have him go up and start scraping to try and knock the steps because it would stick to the side. It was a very kind of clayey, sticky type material. So they went to a vibratory hopper, which worked really well. They didn't have to have somebody up there trying to mess with that or shut down. Um, the, oops. the stock piled in there, when you went out and looked at it, it looked just like a typical dirt. I took it to a and they said, oh, this doesn't have anything in it. It's just dirt. And so it was kind of interesting on that. Um, the sludge hauling didn't land application. After the sludge was out there, probably year, about a year, we worked, or the local office worked about a year and a half to find somebody that was willing to take the sludge because nobody wanted sludge. They were quite accustomed to doing um, land application of litter, but sludge was something they hadn't dealt with. There was a contractor out of the panhandle that came down and started the Landowner actually paid for the sludge to be hauled and put on his property. So that saved about $90,000. Um, and then we went, I had to hands off to the person that was removing the sludge from the site. They left us a very, very clean site as far as they got everything. So it made the next phase of cleaning up everything and putting it together much easier. Um, the slabs removed, then final grading, we awarded the contract in August 2011. It did not include vegetation and reseeding. We've been in a drought in this area. Minus that five to six inch rainfall event, we may have had two other rainfall events in that five year period. So, um, but there wasn't enough water that they could put on the site to get vegetation established, so we eliminate that out of that contract. Um, the power poles, we'd originally agreed with the power company on the cost to relocate and move them, and so they had to come back and renegotiate, and they were willing to semi-honor the original agreement, but not completely, so that was a little bit additional cost. And then this is final graded site, no lagoons. It took them, I think, about 28 days to place 28,000 cubic yards of fill. Um, then we did vegetation and paperwork, and this was one of those of, I get a call on a Monday, uh, we need to seed this week, get the stuff together, get it contracted, and done by Friday. We waited all this time, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, we already told it, we better go now. So, anyway, um, we did analysis for sludge. All of this is in the ASABE paper that I presented, and I think it's also on the website for this. But as far as nitrogen, the phosphorus spray, it was around 4.4% in the sludge. Uh, and then on an analysis from 2009, it was 5.7%. The wastewater analysis wasn't really anything surprising, pretty low on the majority. And uh, the cost, 60000 basically for the removal of the sludge to stockpile it on site. Sludge hauling application was 90000 but that was paid for by another landowner. And then the slab removal and the earthwork were another $88,000, $90,000. And then um, the seeding was $1,800. Of course, this doesn't include any of the additional costs, the survey work, 
uh, specifications, design reports, any of the stuff that we did in-house, negotiating with landowners, trying to find places to go, those types of things. And as far as I've got a couple other little things for y'all. Um, we started this in February 2006. We finished it in October 2011. So that's pretty substantial time frame. Um, lessons learned, cost for application and hauling of the sludge can be reduced by having a contract in place. If you're going to try to turn a key, you can find people that are willing to take the sludge beforehand. I think that would have greatly reduced our cost on going to a turnkey contract. Um, under formal contracting, we still had some worker safety issues, but I think those are greatly reduced when you go to a formal contract versus landowner just hiring somebody to come in and do that. We were able to address those because the fact um, it was a formal contract and it had to meet federal rules and requirements for OSHA. Um, cost of this was around 250000 if you included the offside. Cost of a new lagoon for the same size would be about 70000 So, and then having some flexibility was that we were able to reduce our cost. The value of the phosphorus in the sledge was about half a million dollars what we had out there. But trying to realize that it's a different challenge. And I think there's some future research needs on, or future opportunities for either pelletizing that as a fertilizer, if we can, you know, a mobile type system to come in, pelletize, bag it, and then go to another site. There's lots of lagoons out there that need to be closed in the study. So, anyway. Any questions? Or if I really don't have any time left, so. Yeah, we've got just a couple minutes left for questions. What happened with the slabs? Can you bury anything outside? Or the, slabs the slabs were actually demolished into less than two by two foot, I think is what we required, and buried in on site and compacted in with the earth fill. Any other questions? Well, thank y'all. You don't have to turn this on by the way if you don't want to. Um, I texted Joe Harrison and he called and they quieted down a bit, so if it gets loud again, we'll crank it back up. Um, here's the pointer there, Cheryl. Actually, there's a pointer on the down button.